serve as the executive, serve as the executive director of the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence. I'm so happy that you are all able to join us uh, now in the 10th year of the Buxbaum Institute uh, for this year's annual symposium. Um, today's symposium is the first that we've ever done uh, on virtual. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a new experience for all of us. Uh, the Buxbaum Institute uh, was founded in 2011 uh, with an incredible endowment gift from Matthew and Carolyn Buxbaum Family Foundation. The mission of the Buxbaum Institute is, I'm quoting now from the record, to improve patient care, to strengthen the doctor-patient relationship, to enhance communication and decision-making in healthcare through research and education programs for medical students, junior faculty, senior faculty, uh, and to reduce healthcare disparities. Since the Institute's founding, we have continually sought ways to better fulfill our mission. Currently, the Institute has appointed um, 446 um, master clinicians, senior faculty scholars, junior scholars, medical student scholars, and even undergraduate pre-medical student scholars. Additionally, the Institute has supported 30 programs, including pilot grants, an annual lecture series, and courses for the fourth year medical students. Um, I, I, um, um, to today, I would like very much uh, to introduce uh, our speaker, our lead speaker, uh, in today's program. Um, and our, our lead speaker is a, a dear colleague and, and friend of mine for years, uh, Dr. Bernie Lowe. Uh, after nine years as president, uh, Bernard Lowe, MD, is now president emeritus of the Greenwall Foundation, a foundation whose mission is to expand bioethics knowledge in order to improve clinical biomedical research and public health decision-making policy and practice. Previously, Dr. Lowe served as professor of medicine and director of the medical ethics program at the University of California in San Francisco. A member of the National Academy of Medicine, I'm gonna call it NAM, National Academy of Medicine, Dr. Lowe has chaired NAM committees on sharing clinical trial data in 2015, on conflicts of interest in medical research, education and practice, and more recently in 2019, on evidence-based clinical practice guidelines for prescribing opioids for acute pain. Dr. Lowe serves on the board of directors of the Association for the Accreditation of Human Research Protection Programs and also on the medical advisory panel of Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Dr. Lowe and his colleagues have published well over 200 peer-reviewed articles on ethical issues concerning responsible oversight of research, decision-making near the end of life, the doctor-patient relationship, and conflicts of interest. Uh, uh, the, the talk that Dr. Lowe will give today uh, is entitled Allocation and Triage in COVID-19. Um, uh, what, what I'd like to remind you about uh, before we start hearing Dr. Lowe's lecture is that we encourage you to submit questions under the Q&A option and rather than the chat option. You, you can make statements if you wish on chat but, but the questions and answers should be submitted on Q&A. And with that introduction, it's an honor um, to, uh, to present Dr. Bernard Lowe, Bernie. So Mark, uh, thank you very much for that very kind and gracious introduction. 
It's real pleasure for me to be here today. I only regret that I can't be there in person to visit good friends in, in, in Chicago. Um, I'm going to try and keep my formal remarks relatively brief, leave lots of times for questions. I know Brian Callender is going to be moderating a Q&A, and I, I know there's a session uh, for informal discussion afterwards as well. So let me share my screen. Uh, so I just want to say that I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest. So I want to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, particularly Doug White, now at the University of Pittsburgh, with whom I've worked on the topic of allocation and triage uh, for years and continue to work with him. Uh, Alice uh, Chen is the Deputy Director of the California Department for Health Services, uh, and she faces these issues every day on the ground and actually has a difficult allocation decision coming up that uh, she would love to get your insight on. And Colette de Jong is one of these incredible residents that populate our medical centers and uh, is uh, found time to actually also do research. I'm going to try in this talk to first cover cross-cultural and historical perspectives on triage. Secondly, present an ethical framework for crisis standards of care. And uh, particularly to emphasize uh, health disparities and cultural injust structural injustices, which uh, COVID has really laid bare. Uh, and finally, end with some comments on remaining challenges. This is a picture of uh, Northern Italy, uh, the town of Bergamo. It's a lovely region, wonderful place to visit. Uh, but uh, this uh, uh, year in February, uh, this region was hard hit by the COVID epidemic. Uh, Northern Italy actually has an excellent healthcare system, unlike the south, south of Italy. Uh, and despite uh, really heroic efforts, uh, they were really overwhelmed by the number of cases. They were so overwhelmed that mor the morgues in the hospitals were filled, uh, mortuaries were overwhelmed, and bodies stacked up uh, everywhere there was space in the hospital. Uh, people in Italy said, a physician said, we are on our knees. And another said, we are one step away from collapse. And this is a picture that was widely circulated in Europe. It's actually a nurse who had been working uh, double shifts without a day off and just uh, uh, collapsed at her, at her workstation. Italy is uh, very different culturally than the US. Uh, they're reluctant to talk about tragic choices. Uh, and uh, it's clear that frail elderly patients were not put on ventilators. But as one Italian ICU doctor said, it is not nice to talk about. Uh, and uh, this is very different in the US. And uh, many of you will know that uh, patients with cancer in Italy are not always told their diagnosis. It's much more indirect. Moreover, unlike uh, the sort of very prominent uh, uh, blogging and uh, Twitter accounts that US doctors do, there are few explicit accounts of the emotional reactions of doctors and, and nurses. It's a society that has very high trust in physicians. The Italian uh, uh, professional society of uh, critical care physicians and anesthesiologists issued guidelines several weeks after the crest of the pandemic for allocating ICU beds and ventilators. They came out and said an age limit for the ICU may ultimately need to be set. And they also said it's important to save resources, which may become extremely scarce, for those who have a much greater probability of survival and life expectancy. 
I'd like to suggest that crisis standards are important to, de to uh, develop and make explicit. It's extremely difficult and actually unfair for treating physicians to have to make difficult triage decisions completely on their own. And I, I believe that standards for crisis managed care should be in place before the crisis hits. And we'll talk in America how uh, we also fail to do that. This is a uh, drawing of uh, Napoleon's army after the Battle of Vienna in 1806. This is not the heroic Grand Army, but uh, a depiction of the extreme casualties uh, in war at the time. Uh, tr battlefield triage initially started with officers being evacuated and enrolled enlisted men uh, being left to uh, uh, fend for themselves in the fields. Napoleonic triage, which was interest instituted uh, after this battle, uh, first was egalitarian. Conscripted soldiers and officers received the same priority for treatment. The priority was very clear. The goal of triage was to return soldiers to fighting. And priority was to the most severely wounded, but who were treatable. They were the ones who got ambulance evacuation, which is another innovation of Napoleon's army. Those who were too sick to help, to benefit from assistance, received lower priority. And those who would do well without assistance uh, were on their own. Let's skip forward 200 years. On August 29th, 2005, Hurricane Tr Katrina hit New Orleans head on. It devastated the town, uh, which as you know, is under sea level. Streets were flooded, transportation was cut off, uh, and Relief efforts were non-existent or extremely chaotic, and people really had to fend for themselves. These people are trying to evacuate little children on their own. The water sometimes got much deeper, uh, and here are people uh, struggling in high currents. In New Orleans Parish alone, almost 700 people died, mostly by drowning, and African Americans were, had a much significantly higher death rate than others during Katrina. Hospitals uh, also suffered. This is a hospital that was completely cut off uh, from the rest of the world. Electricity, uh, water, uh, telephones were shut off. Uh, cell phones couldn't be recharged. Medical equipment no longer operated with electricity. Uh, and the staff were really on their own for several days. Hurricane Katrina, I thought, really st struck home to America that you cannot develop or implement standards of crisis during a crisis for the first time. When the crisis standards of care are needed, it is too late to work them out. In the wake of Katrina, Federal government put out a call for states to do preparedness, preparedness planning, including developing crisis standards of care and implementing plans for uh, uh, serious crises. Sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. Many states did not complete preparedness planning. And of the ones who did, there were really serious problems that uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. As of March 2020, uh, if you look state by state at crisis standards of care, 17 states had publicly available po policies and 17 said they were in the process of developing them. Uh, now, what are crisis standards of care? We're talking about situations where the need for medical care greatly exceeds the supply. And therefore, not all who might benefit from ICU care and ventilator support 
and I might parenthetically add and want to ex receive it, can receive it because of the shortage. Now, crisis standards of care should be approved state policies or, or uh, uh, municipal policies activated by formal declaration of public health emergency by the governor. Uh, the standards need to be operational and actionable. Uh, they're actually step-by-step -step things for physicians, nurses, first responders to do. Now, crisis standards of care presuppose that other things have been tried and proved unsuccessful. There have been attempts to increase the supply and decrease the demand for ICU services. Uh, people have tried to provide equivalent care with fewer resources. And COVID, I think, was remarkable, has been remarkable for inspiring creativity and improvisations, not only by fr frontline healthcare workers, uh, but by uh, researchers, uh, tinkerers, and inventors. Uh, we learned, for example, that you could avoid uh, the need for a ventilator by prone positioning, putting a patient on their belly. And people with COVID could tolerate a much lower PO2 than the level at which people are uh, traditionally intubated. Uh, the official uh, news is that the need for triage was averted in the US, but during the first surge, many uh, municipalities and uh, cities came on the razor's edge for needing to, uh, to triage. Now, how can we improve current policies? Uh, first, I think we need to say that the process for developing crisis standards of care should be iterative. Uh, and it, it, we should view it as a, 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 a policy that needs a continuous uh, improvement. And I would include articles that uh, I and my colleagues have written. Certainly, if we look back even several months, there are things we would have said differently and advocated differently. Among the things I think that uh, needed, need more attention are first, how to address the structural injustices that cause the health disparities that uh, COVID has, has, has revealed. Uh, as you know, uh, Blacks, Latinx people, Native Americans have much higher caseloads uh, and uh, much higher rates of death. Uh, and secondly, uh, it's important to avoid discrimination uh, against multiple categories of, of vulnerable people. So I'm going to switch now to uh, talking, suggesting an ethical framework for triage of uh, ICU beds and bed measures. First, there are multiple ethical principles at stake that seem to make moral sense in crisis standards of care. Uh, and I listed four. First, reducing mortality benefits the community as a whole. On the whole, I think most of us would rather see fewer deaths in the ICU from COVID, fewer inpatient deaths than more deaths. Secondly, there needs to be fair allocation among those in need. And we need to work out what we mean by fairness and also how to implement when decisions may, need to be made quickly. Third, there needs to be fair process, fair procedures, as well as substantive fairness. Uh, it makes a difference that people think can, can trust that the decision-making process was fair. And four, we should respect uh, patients as persons as much as possible uh, during the emergency crisis. I'm not gonna say very much about four, I'll spend my time today on, on one through three. So one, uh, reduce mortality. Uh, first, uh, we strongly advocate a scoring system rather than uh, blanket exclusions by category. And that's because a scoring system 
is flexible. It can adapt to changes in both supply and demand. Categorical exclusions are inflexible. You say, this group of patients won't get a ventilator. Do we really mean that? Even if the supply enlarges or the uh, demand decreases? Uh, the pandemic is dynamic and uh, things wax and wane sometimes very quickly in different regions. And unfortunately, I think there are many uh, public health infectious disease specialists who are concerned there will be a second wave uh, in the fall uh, coinciding with uh, the influenza season. Secondly, when we talk about reducing mortality, it's important to be precise and to specify the outcome. What do we mean? Do we mean just survival to hospital discharge? Or do we also mean near-term survival? Now, in uh, our original JAMA article, we use the term short-term survival. And uh, in talking to, to many people, uh, we would agree that near-term survival is a much better term. What do we, why, do we, why do we believe that near-term survival is important? Uh, oh, first let me uh, talk a minute about what we use to uh, put people in different levels of prognostication, prognosticated uh, inpatient mortality. The sequential organ failure assessment score, the SOFA score, predicts inpatient hospital mortality. It's based on six routinely gathered uh, uh, measurements, parameters that are, are quite uh, a standard in clinical care. I won't read through them all. There are six different organ systems. You get zero to, uh, to four points for each, and then you add up the total score. Uh, total score of over 11 or 12 uh, is a bad prognosis, very bad prognosis. Uh, oh, and higher scores are worse. So we believe that there should be some adjustment to the SOFA score to give a lower priority to patients who are expected to die within a year from an end-stage condition, even if they survived the acute hospitalization and received appropriate condition appropriate treatment for the end stage condition. So how do you make the adjustment? Which patients get an adjustment and how large an adjustment? Uh, looks like I left off a slide, which I need to just walk you through. Uh, so, so why do we say that near-term prognosis matters? So consider uh, two patients, uh, one a previously healthy youngish man of say 45, 46, uh, who develops uh, 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 COVID with multi-system uh, failure, acute renal failure, ventilatory failure, hypotension, multiple coagulopathies. Uh, he has a, for the sake of argument, Let's say his SOFA score is high, 12, 13, 14. But if he survives, he's likely to do well. Now, COVID can have a lot of chronic sequelae, uh, but uh, he, he, there's nothing, he has no other end stage condition. Uh, consider, on the other hand, uh, a patient who, uh, is older, say in his 70s, uh, and just has one organ system uh, at failing his lungs, but he also has inoperable ca pancreatic cancer, and he was unable to tolerate chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Now, he will most likely have a better prognosis from COVID, but if he survives, he goes back to having his inoperable cancer and no uh, 
uh, uh, available treatments to him to try and uh, change the course of illness. So if we only relied on the SOFA score, the older gentleman with widespread cancer, with inoperable cancer, would get priority over the younger person who, if he survived, uh, would have uh, an expectation of multiple years of life. So that's why we believe an adjustment is uh, appropriate. So uh, I'd also like to say that uh, we feel that exclusion of categories of patients who are felt to have a poor prognosis, even if ventilators is a uh, inpatient mortality, uh, is a bad idea. It ignores that the supply of ventilators can change in a matter of days. And if you look at the policies of states that have these, they often uh, are uh, very vaguely written and hard to operationalize. So a very common one is metastatic cancer with a poor prognosis. Well, what exactly does that mean? Who is in and who is out? Uh, people with metastatic breast cancer have a poor prognosis, but there are many treatments uh, that are available that uh, can palliate life. Uh, uh, and similarly, with uh, increasingly now uh, with metastatic uh, uh, carcinoma of the colon. Within any given category, there's tremendous individual patient variation, and assigning people by categories. Uh, deprive them of an individual assessment of how they're likely to do. And finally, the list that's included in state policies is usually about 10 and uh, at most, and other groups with a similarly poor prognosis are not listed. So it's unfair in what groups are not considered. I'm sorry, I keep uh, hitting the I wave in front of my trackpad, it, it jumps. Another thing that's important to clarify is there are people who are at home on chronic ventilators, uh, for example, uh, uh, patients with, uh, with ALS, uh, and they should get to keep their ventilators when they're admitted to the hospital. We also feel that some things that appear to be fair allocation policies actually aren't. So first come, first served, and a random lottery would lead to more in hospital deaths because you could end up assigning a, a ventilator in a bed to someone who is, has so many uh, organ systems uh, failing that their in hospital prognosis is poor even with a ventilator. There are also problems with first come, first served that have to do with uh, barriers to access to care. And I'll talk about that more a little bit later on. So I want you to just look at the first two lines. So this is how we uh, tried to operationalize. Uh, first uh, row is the prognosis for survival using SOFA score by quartiles. We suggested um, four quartiles and uh, a point eight for the ascending severity of illness. So uh, more points uh, gives you a lower priority. Uh, we also suggest a correction for near-term prognosis due to an end-stage medical condition for which treatment will not uh, prolong life. And that's, uh, we tried to operationalize that as uh, death within one year is expected. Uh, and we said that they should have four points. I'll get to the next two lines after I go through the uh, fairness considerations. Let's see if I can go around. So another aspect of our, of our recommendation is that assignment of a ventilator should be a time-limited trial with regular reassessment. Patients who are admitted and then deteriorate uh, sharply uh, over a period of days, as, as opposed to having uh, an expected course. And we know that uh, patients with COVID ventilatory failure often need long-term ventilation. But someone who comes in 
and then continues to get worse despite maximal treatment, should they uh, uh, have their uh, uh, assignment to a ventilated bed uh, reassessed? We believe that's uh, important if we want to uh, uh, maximize the number of uh, inpatient lives saved. And the policy should be based on the best available evidence uh, and modified when good evidence uh, becomes available. Uh, I think we're still looking for uh, very good studies on rigorously done studies on uh, validating the SOFA score uh, in, in COVID uh, and other studies on how the allocation policy actually works in, in, uh, on the ground. So let me now uh, shift to my second criteria, which is fair allocation among those in need. I think we should start by saying that in historical epidemics, going back to the plague, cholera, uh, there has always been a disproportionate, uh, the bad impact on the poor and on minorities. And there also has been discrimination in public health policies, including in the US. Uh, so that's the background, and I think we're seeing this today with, with COVID. Uh, the first point about fair allocation is there should be no exclusions by categories that should be protected. Age, disability, religion, race, color, national origin, gender, sexual orientation. Some of these are actually protected by, by law and interpreted to be constitutionally protected. But then there are others that I think are ethically uh, 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 appropriate categories for uh, protection. Uh, and also, I think, uh, perceived quality of life as quality of life perceived by others, whether it's family, doctors, or nurses, should be excluded because we know that uh, people living with a disability consistently rate their own quality of life higher than others rate it. Uh, first come, first serve is not fair allocation because there are tremendous barriers to access to care. People who don't have insurance, where uh, they live in a neighborhood where uh, there just aren't that many hospitals and the hospitals that are there are safety net hospitals that are underfunded, under-resourced and, uh, and over easily overwhelmed. It's important to consider the social determinants of health disparities. And I know that uh, a number of you in Chicago are, are working on uh, health disparities. Uh, Ethically, I think at a minimum, we would not want to worsen existing disparities. But we would go beyond that and argue that we should ameliorate disparities in the context of ventilators and ICU beds. What do we mean by that? Again, as background in COVID, uh, there are structural injustices in the US that cause a really market health disparities. Uh, I mentioned the disproportionate number of cases and fatalities in uh, 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 minority groups, people of color. There are multiple pathways by that uh, for that, and I think some of you in Chicago are actually researching those those mechanisms. We recommend adjusting the uh, scores based on medical prognosis to give higher priority to people who live in a high area. Depriv an area with a high a ADI, Area Deprivation Index. Oops. So the ADI uh, measures socioeconomic disadvantage within the unit of a census block, which is about 1,500 people. Uh, within that census block, it computes a score based on education, employment, housing quality and poverty within the area. So I think you can describe uh, an individual score based on the neighborhood they live in. We also think that some priorities should be given uh, 
to some essential workers. Now, not all essential workers, but those who are unable to socially distance, who have frequent face-to-face -face contact with other people, and frequent COVID exposures. Uh, often, uh, doctors are, are quite successful at advocating priority for doctors, but really, it's a category far greater than doctors and nurses. I think we should include nursing home aides, home health worker, home health workers, uh, police, first responders, bus drivers, meat plant workers, all who uh, uh, meet these categories of having to work where they can't socially distance and have face-to-face -face contacts. Uh, Part of this, I think, is reciprocity. Uh, these are people who put themselves knowingly at risk in, in their work in order to help others. Uh, and if you come to the uh, uh, talk tomorrow, the second day of seminar, that's going to be the topic of my talk. There's also an instrumental value. We know COVID is going to be uh, recurrent in, in wage, waves and surges. And we would hope that these people will be able to return to work in, in later surges. So we would add on two more rows. One for people living in a high, uh, uh, an area with a high ADI. We would subtract a point if the ADI is eight, nine, or 10 on a 10 point scale. We will also subtract one point for an essential worker in a high risk occupation. Now, many people who are essential workers also live in an area with a high ADI, and they would get two points off. And again, I think it's open to discussion. Is this the right weight? Should be a greater weight, and so forth. But this is the, the framework that uh, we would like to uh, propose. The ADI, by the way, uh, can be calculated, there are, uh, uh, it can be calculated electronically based on the patient's address. Uh, and there's an app from the University of Wisconsin who does it, that does that. So tiebreakers, there are, there's a high likelihood that people will end up with identical priority scores. Uh, how, how should you break the tie? We would advocate, uh, if one patient is significantly younger, and that has to be operationalized, that patient should get priority. Uh, but if there are identical priority scores and similar age, then random allocation is, is fair. Now, some will say, oh, that's all well and good, but rather than triaging patients, why don't we reallocate ventilators? Uh, uh, to different hospitals. So the idea is you could transfer ventilators uh, from hospi to hospitals with shortages of ventilators uh, from hospitals that have an excess. And that was hard to work out in advance, uh, but now I think in the, uh, after the first wave has subsided, there are cooperative arrangements among hospitals, even in different states, to ship ventilators to where they're needed. Again, to me, that uh, is, illustrates the importance of having these, pro these policies worked out in advance. And more than just paper policies, what we learned from preparedness exercises is the people in different roles need to know who, who each other are and to talk with each other. So the director in one state uh, needs to talk to, needs to know who the directors are in other states and regions. Now, another recommendation is within a region, within a city, to transfer patients from hospitals that are overwhelmed to hospitals with open ICU beds and ventilators. New York City actually had a formal policy to this effect. They put it in place. Uh, during their first surge, but the policy did not work in practice. Uh, hospital transfer phones basically are one-way phones. They're from well-resourced hospitals 
two safety net hospitals to transfer patients who are uh, uninsured or underinsured. People in safety net hospitals in New York City said, oh, there's a hospital in a different borough who has open beds. Let's transfer some of our patients. The phones weren't answered. So I also want to talk about a fair process for triage decisions. This has many components. First, the policy needs to be transparent. It needs to be openly accessible. And when I first started doing this earlier this year, it was really hard to get some state policies. You, it, you had to do multiple searches and they were sort of hidden. The process for how the policy was arrived at also needs to be transparent. And the policy by which uh, decisions are actually made at a hospital level need to be transparent. We strongly advocated having a triage committee or officer make these really hard decisions as to who has priority. These should not be in the hands of the individual physician. The individual physician, we think, needs to focus on the well being of her patient and not be concerned about. Uh, how uh, other patients might be affected. There needs to be an appeals process. We thought it really should be for errors in calculating triage scores. But there needs to be regular retrospective review of how the policy is working out in practice. And there needs to be quality improvement to refine, improve the process, and if necessary, to change the policy. So let me pivot towards the end here on remaining challenges. So one challenge is forming public policy. I'm old fashioned. I still believe in evidence based policy. It's better to know uh, what things work and what doesn't work. So it's important, I think, to ask, uh, assess the outcomes of policies as rigorously as is possible. And, with real world evidence. And I think we have to pay attention to how the policy is implemented on the ground. Is it something that works at the level of the ICU and hospital? Um, I think there's a, a, ter a, a role for modeling studies that take policies that are uh, used or, or proposed and model them on uh, actual data sets with, with COVID to see what the impacts are, particularly the unintended impacts. And then I think there should be a feedback loop where policies are refined and altered based on evidence of, of outcomes. Uh, this whole feedback loop of evidence-based policies uh, uh, very uh, uh, precarious at this point in our history. I think the, another big remaining challenge is forming public policy. Uh, one thing that we've learned is that there has not been sufficient public engagement and feedback. Uh, and it really should be publics because there are many different communities with very different points of view. Uh, I think it's particularly uh, important that we, we uh, engage and hear from disadvantaged communities who are now doing the worst in the, the pandemic. And I think there needs to be a board, broader composition of policy making committees uh, to include uh, more representatives from groups that uh, uh, could be harmed by uh, policies that don't pay much, enough attention to fairness. Finally, uh, we need to rebuild public trust, which is really low in this country, but also around the world. Uh, we have not had consistent evidence-based evidence -based segmented messages, messaging that engages the values of audiences, that should be plural. Uh, 
if you look at statements by state and federal leaders, uh, they're uh, disjoint, often inconsistent, and often not evidence-based. Uh, segmented, if you, know, you talk to people in advertising, they said, well, you don't have a homogeneous target audience. You need to think of what are the different segments and how do you reach them, how do you engage them. We're now beginning to try and do that with allocation of uh, vaccines. Uh, it's really hard and remains to be seen if we're going to be successful. I think we have to try and identify credible spokespeople for different audiences. So community leaders, leaders of community-based organizations that people trust uh, in the community. Uh, religious leaders who can speak to their communities, and we've seen, uh, well, let me just say that, and sports stars, people who have a lot of fans and followers. Uh, uh, I personally think that uh, the NBA has uh, done some really nice public service messages about uh, social distancing and wearing masks. Wearing masks. And actually demonstrated that they can do that. So let me end the formal remarks with a uh, take home message. Triage standards of, of care uh, under crisis standards of care should be first, developed in advance. Second, take into account health disparities and structural injustices. And third, engage publics meaningfully. Uh, so let me uh, stop there uh, and thank you and turn off my screen share. So Brian, Dr. Callender, I'll turn it over to you for, for Q's and A's. Well, Great, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for uh, that uh, sort of opening lecture on the sort of sub-theme of resource allocation that's going to be throughout this lecture series throughout the year. I thought it gave us sort of great historical perspective as well as a general framework on how we should think about resource allocation. So thank you very much. And we will jump over to the Q&A. So anybody who has questions, we will try to address whichever questions you have through the Q&A. Um, and so I'm going to sort of uh, start with the first question um, by Will Parker, one of our Palm Critical Care attendings here. And he asks, in your Annals of Internal Medicine paper in 2009, and the Pennsylvania state system, and additional comorbidity categories are identified for near-term prognosis, such as major, a two-point deprioritization in the PA system. It appears you have dropped this from your current framework. Why? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the question. Uh, so in 2008, we actually thought there should be several levels of uh, outcomes considered beyond the hospital survival. So one was a near-term outcome. And we also thought that a longer-term outcome, several years, up to five years, should be considered. We now believe that uh, the five-year prognosis correction uh, should be dropped, that it's, it's, it's a lot, there's a lot more uh, uncertainty in how, how accurate those predictions are, uh, and uh, probably a lot of variability as well. So we, we retain a near-term option, which we now define as um, uh, having an end-stage disease for which uh, death is expected within a year. And again, we're not great prognosticators as physicians, but uh, I think it's, a, it's an intuition that, that's worth pointing out, uh, keeping it. Great. And, and actually the next two questions relate to sort of the, I think the near-term prognosis. And so, um, the, the first would be statistically, what percent of those predicted to survive only one year would live only one year, not more. So I think here you get to the sort of prognosis, prognosis and statistics of that. 
And then uh, Will Parker again asked a related question that what is your formal ethical justification for a four point penalty for death within one year? Great questions. Uh, so I, I think uh, I would say that there needs to be more empirical work on how accurate doctors' estimates of patients likely to die within a year because they have an end-stage disease. How accurate is that? Uh, uh, some years ago, we did uh, studies with, uh, this was gosh, in the 80s, uh, when ventilators were scarce during the AIDS, AIDS, AIDS epidemic, that uh, it depends on the organ system. And so, for example, we know that the model we often have in mind is metastatic cancer, which is sort of monotonically downhill. But there are other diseases that have uh, exacerbations and emissions, if you will, CHF, COPD. Uh, so I, I think we need to uh, look at how accurate prognostic predictions are. Now, the question of how much weight you give to a factor, that's a terrific question. And I think one could easily make an argument it should be two points rather than one point. I think data might help here, but I think, and I would certainly be comfortable if someone said, you know, I think we think it's four is too many. That's our state's going to cut it, cut it back. Let me just say that I think different regions through a deliberative process will come up with different final scores. Uh, uh, Maryland uh, did a uh, deliberative democracy exercise where they prioritized, uh, uh, or they gave some priority to some, something that's been termed uh, ability to, a chance to, leave, to live a full lifespan over all stages of life. Now others have said, that's really discriminating against the elderly. So I'm perfectly open. I don't have a ethically defensible argument other than to say it should be non-zero. I think two could be fine, three, one. Um. Next question then is sort of addressing the issue of essential workers. Where do government officials, both sort of nationally and locally fit in as essential workers? Yeah, well, um, so it's actually a, a very interesting report that uh, Brookings, formerly the Brookings Institute, put out about who are essential workers. So if I can take a couple of minutes, I learned a lot. First, essential workers, there's a list of federal guidelines, but it's states and sometimes counties that actually have formal designations. And it turns out a third to 40% of all American workers are considered essential. So I wanted to narrow it down to essential workers who can't work remotely. Mark Sigler and I were talking about caring for our primary care patients via telemedicine. So to the extent that we're able to do that, I, I like to think of essential, or at least fulfilling an important role, but the extent I can do that remotely, I shouldn't qualify. So it's people who can't work remotely. And then all, so I think in terms of the question about politicians, politicians can, you know, can't they work via Zoom? Sure, it's not quite the same. You can't go in and put your, your arm around your colleague and say, now look, you can't be serious about opposing this measure. What can I trade you for? Maybe you can't do that. But I think you, you need to say, can you adapt your work to socially distance or wear masks? You know, if you want to meet in person, put on a mask and stay six feet apart. So I think I would not want to accept the moral hazard where someone says, well, I'm too important to wear a mask or socially distance, but I should get priority. I think that that just doesn't seem seem right. Let me stop there before I put my foot in my mouth. Okay. The next question then is 
when we talk about ventilator shortages, I also think about staffing to care for vented patients. And this doesn't seem to be frequently explicitly discussed. So to what extent is staffing a limiting factor? And if staffing is a limiting factor, how does that impact ventilator sharing? Oh, great question. It's a hugely important factor, and it can be a limiting factor. Uh, again, uh, those of you who are in pulmonary critical care can, can correct me, but my impression is that pulmonary critical care physicians and nurses, respiratory therapists, have really been extraordinary figuring out how to increase staffing. And I don't mean just you know, work longer shifts and take fewer days off. You can't work more than seven days a week. Uh, but many people who are not primarily involved with managing ventilators day to day were retrained to learn how to do that. Uh, I think uh, in addition, people got really good at having almost pyramidical systems of care where the ICU physician stepped into a consultant role to the frontline people managing the ventilators. Uh, nurses, similarly, uh, they retrained themselves. And then I think we have to recognize that there are some healthcare workers who really view what they do as a mission. And they went to volunteer at hospitals in uh, uh, understaffed areas uh, and to, to, to sort of designate their, uh, 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 to, to, to disseminate their, their, their expertise. I think the other thing that, that uh, again, ICU folks, critical care folks can correct me, but my impression is that ICU doctors learned a lot and they shared their knowledge with each other over uh, informal social media networks and email chains. And people learned how to get better at doing this because a lot of things that were considered uh, uh, standard care turned out to be unnecessary. We got really good at learning who didn't need to be ventilated but still could do well with a PO2 that seemed ridiculous at all. And, and, and there was sort of a, in addition to that question is that that you know, the, recognizing that uh, agency or travel nurses and healthcare workers are costly resources, does this play into further disadvantaging safety net hospitals and the populations they serve? And I think this sort of came up when states were sort of bidding against each other for various resources. So how does this sort of come into play? Yeah, so I would separate out material resources from human resources. So. Again, for the human resources, I really tip my hat to healthcare workers who volunteer to go to the worst places. And there's a contingent from San Francisco who went to the safety net hospitals to work in New York City for several weeks. I think you're absolutely right when it gets into how do I get whatever it is, more masks, uh, more ventilators, hospitals who are better resourced and have better connections do better. Or in some cases, we found that you, you call up one of your trustees or big donors and have them use their business connections. Uh, I think, you know, I, I think there is a, there can be a role for governments in coordinating or playing a role in market failures. And I say that very cautiously talking to a Chicago audience. But I think that uh, there is a role for centralized uh, uh, purchasing uh, uh, gov governments to, to, to use their levers of policy to encourage more production, and then to allocate to hospitals on the basis of need and cases, rather than who could get the things on the, on the market. Uh, we tried to, well, states did some of that when remdesivir was first released uh, for, for use with hospitalized patients. There was an attempt, at least in California, to allocate two counties and hospitals on the basis of the number of cases. 
So it made some attempt, albeit crude, to allocate on the basis of need. But it's a great series of questions, and I think the staffing is, is, is key. Let me also just say, because I'm going to say a little bit about this tomorrow, uh, I think medical students who said, graduate us early, we will work as interns in our own hospitals. We're almost ready. You teach us, we'll do it. Okay. So the next question then is, uh, I agree that triage formulas and guidelines are incredibly important. How publicized should the algorithms be in order to make appropriate decisions, but also not turn off the public and make them distrustful? Boy, great questions. So Italy clearly takes one side of the equation. They said, look, you have to make some tough decisions in life. And it's better you don't talk too explicitly because then everybody just appreciates how awful the choices are. Uh, I think the problem by not being transparent is that people don't know what's going on and that they can't say, hey, let's rethink about that. If you look at that part of the policy, this is what it implies for this group of people. Is that really right? So I think, <sighs> Uh, a very good friend of mine is, is, uh, 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 has had very senior positions in public health. Uh, and he has said that who is the spokesperson? How good is the spokesperson? And what message is that? Uh, I don't know how much I can give away of tomorrow's talk, Mark. So, uh, Leaders vary a lot. We've had a lot of bad examples around the world. I think a good example is the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. Uh, her message has always been spot on. We are in this together. We have to work together. It's going to be difficult. All of us would prefer not to have to do this, but we're all going to do it. And I'm going to do it with you because it's important for all of us. And it's that kind of, these are tough decisions. I wish we didn't have to make them. We're doing everything in our power not to have to make these tough choices. And here's what we're doing, prone positioning, sharing ventilators, and plugging two people into the same ventilator. Uh, having do-it-yourself inventors come up with you know, ventilator replacements. Uh, but I think part of, you know, things are serious. I mean, COVID is a serious illness. The pandemic really hit hard when the mortuaries can't do their job, something is wrong. And not to acknowledge that just seems to be, um, we'd like to, I'd like to see more from, from leaders. Right. So there, there are a number of questions about sort of the disparities um, issue that you brought up. And so, I'll, I'll throw one out there and we'll try to sort of maybe do a few rapid fire, but allocating sure. resources fairly within the hospital only addresses disparities for those once they get to the hospital. So do you think using a reserve system would do a better job of fairly allocating resources at the community level? Um, yeah, it, I think, and I would certainly urge that for other interventions that are given out in community settings. So certainly I think with, with vaccines in particular, it's really important to, to redouble efforts to communicate with people in hard hit communities, to help them understand, uh, to understand their concerns and to, to try, and, try and address them. I think stockpiling equipment is important. You touched on that. Hospitals, you know, Sure, you can have a floating hospital pull up to a dock. You can put a hospital in Central Park. But no one has talked about putting hospitals in the middle of uh, Harlem, uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, uh, which is where they're needed. Uh, and the, you know, the hospital, floating hospital in western, the western side of Manhattan on the piers went empty. So great idea, couldn't hold off. And to get a patient, from an overworked 
public hospital to those settings was hard. Uh, in the long term, I think there's clearly an answer that we've got to rebuild the safety net structure, which you know has really deteriorated in terms of safety at hospitals. Um, your Cook County shut down, and that was when I was a house officer, which was a traditional place for down the shore to get, get care. Uh, so I think there's always a question of how far back do you go? And I think you need to address the root causes in the community. And then for community level interventions, I think you need to make sure the supply is adequate and the infrastructure to engage the public is, is adequate. And that's a disproportionate investment of resources. Great. And, and this is sort of a, a question that, that sort of tacks onto that in terms of thinking about safety net hospitals. Do you have some thoughts about how you get high level institutions to accept patients from safety net hospitals, especially when patients require ICU therapies, which the higher level hospitals excel at? Yeah. So to just ask the question straight out, how many people get transferred from a safety net hospital to a quaternary referral center for ECMO, right? Which you have to do there. Uh, so I, I, I spent all my faculty career in a medical center that has a safety net hospital at San Francisco General, one of the three primary rotations for the house staff. And everybody rotates there. And the faculty who work there are very highly regarded. Uh, so I think it's got to be part of the mission of academic hospitals and referral centers that if we're going to train uh, students, residents, and fellows, that's, we, we need those hospitals. We need to serve those people because, you know, I, we are also a public institution at UCSF, so we have, we have some support from the state. So I think we have consciously made part of our mission be to serve the community. Um, Seattle, Kings County, I think is another example of a safety net hospital that has has, has, has not only survived, but, but thrived. And they have a wonderful fundraiser every year where they say, if you're in a car accident on whatever that highway is that runs through Seattle, you will come to that safety net hospital's trauma center. You have a stake in making that a strong hospital. And it's not just the trauma team, it's all the other nurses and staff are gonna be taking care of it. So safety net hospitals are part of all of us, even if we don't think of getting primary care. Uh, another question then is, is, what is the appropriate level of authority for declaring that the time for crisis standards has arrived? Is oh, this a statewide decision, metropolitan statistical area, county, city, individual institution, and how prepared is the public health sector of the US to lead such a decision? Wow, what a question. So it depends. I think the states are supposed to have policies. Governors make decla formal declarations and they should do that. Uh, one of the things under our governmental structure we've seen is counties and municipalities disagreeing with the governor, let alone the governor disagreeing with the federal. Uh, so that the people closest to the actual uh, crisis on the ground may have a clearer view. It has to be through a uh, authorized law. So if the county allows or if the city allows the mayor to do, or the county supervisor to declare public health emergency, that, that's okay. Uh, hospital, I think, I think hospitals need to buy into the state policy and they, and I think a given hospital may have a need for a policy at a time when the, the rest of the uh, geographic area doesn't. So if you think about mass disasters, one shot mass disasters. Uh, so uh, there could be a crisis within a, uh, a city or even just their trauma center that doesn't affect 
the rest of the, the, the stage. And so I think you want to preserve some flexibility, but it needs to be done in a, an authorized manner. Sort of a, along those lines, and this is something sort of I noticed when sort of doing the math that 17 states had public policy, 17 were working on them, on them. that doesn't add up um, to- Doesn't give you a, a clear majority, does it? Yeah, and so the, 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 the question from, from the Q&A is, it is probably fair to say that even post COVID, many states will refuse to complete preparedness planning or develop crisis standards of care. How do you recommend health systems move forward? These are fabulous questions. No, I think health systems should do their own planning because they may be stressed in ways that the rest of the, the area is not. And they can certainly redeploy things, transfer patients within their own, their own hospital, uh, their, own, their, their, their own system. Let, let me just say that there is value, I believe, to preparing this planning, even if it doesn't come out with a blue ribbon policy. I think just, you know, in the after, I mean, I don't know how many of you remember Katrina, but it was a total disaster that uh, different emergency services operations operated on different radio frequencies. So they literally could not talk to each other. They did not know who to call if they said, we need help with this or that. So just knowing who the people are to talk to so that they recognize you and you recognize them because you're at this meeting, even if the policy didn't come out, those connections are important. And I'll contradict what I said before about Zoom. I tend to think that those building of bonds works better person to person rather than Zoom. Brian, yes. could I say a quick word? Um, I, I want to tell the, uh, the, the attendees that tomorrow at about one o'clock, um, um, there will be a, a Buxbaum Symposium um, for which um, Zoom links will be available. And, and, and Bernie will be speaking on the topic, physician, and medical student responses to COVID-19. Uh, th that will be the topic tomorrow. But what the plan for today is that at 1.30, we'll be meeting, um, Bernie will be meeting with our fellows. Um, and I see that you still have 15 or 18 questions that have been raised. I, I think my suggestion would be that we just continue this discussion right now with the fellows online um, and continue uh, the, the number of questions that are there um, rather than breaking up and, and uh, removing the audience. I, I know part of the audience will have to go back to their clinical work um, and um, and we'll give some focus to the to the uh, fellows uh, who are with us, but continue um, the questions that you have, if that sounds all right. If that works, go can ahead. Can I just ask for like a three minute break? Yes. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> and just to say, it's an added inducement for the talk tomorrow. Uh, I am shamed by Mark, and I will be wearing a tie tomorrow, <laughs> and I will be using a University of Chicago background. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> no, I think it's great. I think it's great. So I'll be back in about three minutes. Okay. Okay. Good. That, that so the good. only problem with saying on this line is that the fellows cannot um, talk. They'll have to continue to write questions. But Brian's doing a great job, but I just want the fellows to realize that they can't talk because of the way this is set up. Um, if, if in writing the questions, the fellows say um, McLean fellow, and then write the question, uh, let, let's give a certain priority to, uh, to those issues and those questions. Bri Brian, you can keep an eye out for that. Sure. How many points are we giving them? 
Uh, uh, we'll, we'll try for five or below. Brian, since I actually can't write into the q and I just want to add a question um, after the fellows, which is just the whole decision of using the SOFA score, which wasn't really designed for COVID-19. And so therefore raises issues, not just the fact that it has some biases in it, but actually being used for a purpose that was not originally developed or intended. Could you, tell, could you tell us what it was originally designed for? Yeah, it was designed for sepsis. Interesting. Um, and so, well, Bernie, Bernie is back, so I'm going to hand it back to Brian. Okay. Let me just uh, uh, raise um, a technical point. I don't know if Yolanda Yu is on the call, but actually I was given a separate Zoom login for the session uh, yeah. The Q and A with the fellows. I'm just wondering if there are people who are logged on there, as opposed to here, and whether they can be redirected. Um, yeah, I can go check, but they should all still be on this Zoom since um, we haven't ended yet. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Yeah, Lainey, do you want to repeat that question, or should Brian do it? Oh, Brian's in charge. I mean, you can repeat it. If, I, I don't, I don't okay. need to be your mouthpiece. So, so Bernie, the, the one question that we'd like to ask is just the whole decision of using the SOFA score. Which is originally designed for, for sepsis mortality. Yes. No. And given that it's known to have certain biases, given that it, you know, gives people lower scores for certain diseases like diabetes, which are found more in minority communities. Yeah, so I guess the question is, do we think that, I, I agree uh, totally with what you said. So the question is, is there a better objective, easily to calculate score that would just roughly separate people into to prognostic levels? Uh, I, I think, uh, would be great to have something better. Uh, as you know, it's really hard to derive and validate a score. And there have been some things written about uh, prognostication in COVID, but they, um, they're single site institutions. They have their own sort of own independent variables that are not easily uh, calculated universally. So there's a compromise between practicality, accuracy, and fairness. And you've rightly called attention to two, two or three problems. So I'll, I'll sort of try to go, go down the, the order of questions as they were asked, because previously I skipped around a little bit. Um, so uh, one of the earlier questions was, if survivability, according to SOFA score, is nonlinear, in the sense that 10 is similar to 9, but 12 is significantly worse than 11, how do you ethically justify tiebreakers and adjustments that do not account for those jumps in survivability? And why not have tiebreakers within SOFA quartiles? Uh, great question. So again, I appeal to those of you who are, are quantitative modeling types to, to actually model that and, and see. Uh, so the, I guess part of it has to deal with how much, uh, I guess it's a technical question, how much overlap and separability are there between individual increments of a point in SOFA scores? Uh, and so I, I guess the thing is, uh, I would say that it, it, all these uh, uh, problems are, are, are true. And so I think the thing is to replace self with something better that will work at, in, in a hospital. Great. Uh, the next I, I think the point was that it was nonlinear. And so your bucketing isn't 
sort of adapting to the nonlinearity of the SOFA score. Okay, so you, the suggestion is we should give more than a point difference between different levels or make the buckets more. Well, well so healthy. some have argued, so Will Parker, who's one of the people asking many of these questions is trying to argue why not just do it within each score and do a continuous since it's all can be done on computers now. It's not like you're collecting it, having to do it by hand. Yeah, yeah. And again, I would say that's something I would love to see someone said we compared strategy A and strategy B, which is just doing it by individual score. Here's what came out in a retrospective look at the data set or several data sets from, from different hospitals. Um, it's just, I don't just warn, it's important to do it at multiple sites because uh, things vary from hospital to hospital. But I think these are all great points. I would be uh, glad to have these kinds of uh, uh, corrections uh, published and, and analyzed. The next question, you know, thanks you for addressing the moral issue of disparities. And the question is, who do you think should decide what scoring systems or policies to implement to ameliorate disparities. Doctors, you know, legislators, politicians, people. Yeah, so I, so again, it's a political philosophy question. I don't think doctors uh, and academics should be deciding. There's a question as to whether politicians currently without more input are the best people. You know, I, I know that deliberative democracy exercises are controversial and really hard to do. But I think what you're looking for is informed opinion from people who have a particular perspective to contribute. I think the other thing is to have a commission that is very broadly representative and includes representatives from people with various kinds of disabilities, people from various disadvantaged and marginalized communities. Over the course of developing a policy, they learn a lot in terms of hearing about the uh, uh, the, the, the sort of clinical aspects and statistics. Uh, and presumably they can also then go back to their uh, communities for feedback. I think it's really hard when you choose people, like how are they selected, who do they represent, what qualities do, do you look for? But I would, I would favor a broader uh, process uh, and favor a, uh, and strongly encourage a kind of uh, educational engagement process as part of it. So, so this is something that I sort of thought about is throughout your talk in terms of just, and you mentioned the form sort of informed democracy. Um, I, I think, you know, a fair number now argue one, that we're not informed and two, we're sort of a failing democracy, not to sort of be too political, but somebody mm -hmm. did ask the question then, in your take home message, how do you engage the public where mistrust has been impacted by infodemics uh, and sort of disinformation campaigns and what would be a quality first step in considering structural injustices that have deepened health disparity? That's kind of two questions, but I guess focusing on the, the, the lack of, of, you know, an informed right. democracy, maybe. Yeah. Well, I think, so I think you have to really go to the, the grassroots level. And I actually think, I like to sort of try and draw analogies with sort of what we know clinically. So clinically, the first thing is you've got to listen to a patient, hear their story, understand their concerns, which may not be apparent uh, from the onset because you use a doctor-driven h &P. Uh, And I think there are people who really are in tune with the community, the communities, their communities connected with them, uh, who can be informed if they're not already informed. I heard a wonderful talk by the Director of Public Health from uh, District of Columbia. And she made the point that uh, she really engages uh, the 
pastors in the African American community because they have a lot of credibility and really understand what's going on. And she said, where would you send people for, uh, uh, for things uh, like testing? She said, what institutions do people trust? She said, it's the fire department. So people trust the fire department in African American communities in uh, Washington, uh, the way they don't trust the police or hospitals. And she said they're geographically distributed around the city much more equitably. And she said, okay, then you have to sort of work with the firefighters. Uh, and, you know, they're not representative of the community. But I think it, 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 it's, it, it, it's trying to find uh, who's knowledgeable about community concerns and who um, is willing to put the time and effort. But right now, there's a huge effort to try to how do you talk to people about assuming a COVID vaccine will become uh, not proven to be effective and safe? How do you talk to people about it and overcome all kinds of concerns and objections? And I think you really have to start with what's the nature of objections? Uh, and con we have an article coming out next week in the Annals on contact tracing. And one of the things about contact tracing is where it's been, you know, mistrust is rampant, people don't cooperate, uh, they won't even answer the phone. Where it works is people start by saying, the contact tracer says, how can I help you? So it's not sort of I'm in the punishment government mode. So you have to figure out what's going to make people want to engage with you and then understand where they are. I don't have an answer to that, but I think those of you who uh, have been working on health disparities in Chicago and working with community organizations might have a much better idea than that. So one, one of the fellows that, that's on has the question, um, what are your thoughts on post-op transplant patients and ventilator or bed rationing, given that they have sort of already received a scarce resource? Yeah, I, I think I would, uh, you know, I think there are people who are in incredibly high cost, high resource use patients, not just them, but people who've undergone uh, uh, personalized therapy for cancer. I mean, uh, I think I would prefer to go back to, to the, the broader principles and not exclude people uh, on that level. Uh, I also think then you have, once you start talking about lifetime use of resources, then you start running into the other question. How about someone says, well, I'll build a new uh, safety net hospital, you know, $10 billion, just give me the, give me the ventilator. Uh, I, I think that, uh, uh, again, Transplants are certainly are very high risk because they're immunosuppressed, but depending on the transplant, I mean, if you have a five year survival, that's likely, uh, I think I would try and apply the same, the same criteria with this modified SOFA score that you guys are, or replacement SOFA score that you guys are going to be working with us. So, you brought up the SOFA score. There, there is another question from one of the fellows about the SOFA scoring. And so can you comment on the use of the SOFA score and the inherent bias? Should we be providing additional adjustments for the patients that will suffer most from the inherent bias of the SOFA score? And so the sort of does one point adjustment for high ADI sufficiently account for the difference? Uh, I think, again, I don't have any magic uh, way to, to, to weigh those. I think you could easily argue two, three, or even four. Uh, but I think the issue would be, I, I think, I mean, what you're saying is no matter what you do for the scoring and the weighting, it should be justified. And you should just not, not just throw out, oh, we said one. Say, and here's why we chose one. And I would be, you know, there's something there was something similar to this adjusting scores 
to take into account disparities. Uh, in cadaver kidney transplantation, again, some of you may probably, I'm sure, know a lot more about this than I, to try and address the question of um, African American people with end stage renal disease are much less likely to get a kidney transplant for multiple reasons. There was an adjustment made to the scoring system. But that was modeled very carefully by whether it was Yunos or Patel at the time, I don't remember. So, and here's what would happen under the current system and under the modified system. So I think saying, if we tinker here, this is what happens. I actually like that problem solving approach. Uh, so again, my appeal is out to those of you young fellows <laughs> who were, uh, uh, have a strong quantitative background or have a joint degree in economics or something, go to it. Great. Um, I, I guess a sort of a, a potentially sort of devil's advocate or contrarian viewpoint may look that in trying to adjust for past injustices, are you just creating new injustices? Yeah, so, this, so again, this is a really good and I think profound question. So I think, you know, we're facing a terrible uh, set of very difficult set of issues in this country. How far back do you go? I think that within the more proximate you are to the current situation, I think my own view is the stronger the warrant for making an adjustment. So knowing that there are real disparities in access to care, access to hospitals that had a lot of ventilators, I think those corrections really need to be made. I think doing it on a sort of neighborhood basis makes sense. It also sweeps in a lot of other things about education, poor job opportunities, crowded housing, everything else. Uh, similarly, you know, I guess I'm putting an advertisement to this paper coming out next week. Uh, we argue in the analyst paper that uh, contact tracing really needs to offer material support that if you can't quarantine or isolate because you live with a lot of people in cramped space. It's in society's interest to support you in housing and other countries have done that. And also if you can't afford not to work even when you're sick because you're the sole income earner for the family. Other countries and some, to be fair, some places in the US are doing that as well. But that should be part of both adjusting for current inequities, but also for a with a public health pur purpose. But not all uh, uh, counties and states or, or municipalities are doing that, which I think is a real problem. So the, ne the next two questions actually sort of bring up other systems that you mentioned, both the lottery system and sort of the first come first serve. Mm -hmm. um, Given the challenges in constructing and implementing a formal triage system that would function as intended, should the default just be a lottery system? Well, so the lottery system is fair in very many ways, but I think if you work it out, just sort of you know, pick people uh, who have bad prognoses and good prognoses, a lottery will give you more inpatient deaths than a system that even imperfectly is adjusted to, uh, uh, to, to, to prognosis. And to extend, you know, I think we've gone a long way from, you know, some of the older policies are the, the, the first and most important principle is uh, a utilitarian, save the greatest number of lives in the community. I think we're, we're sort of saying, well, that's, that, that, that's a thin, uh, sort of moral vision. But I think to throw that over and say we're so concerned about fairness that outcomes don't matter, I think goes too far the other way. Okay. And so one of the fellows asked, asked the question, do you think there's an ethical difference between allocating ventilators and reallocating ventilators and other scarce resources? So if you can't reallocate then isn't it a de facto first come first served system? Uh, so I, I think you do have to reallocate. 
taking into account the natural history of the disease so that we now know that COVID improvements can be very slow. So you don't, you make a commitment to see people through a natural history. But I think it's really the people who come in and start doing worse and worse and more organ systems go down. Uh, I think at a certain point, whereas you might in a ordinary clinical setting say that, well, we're starting to talk about palliative care, we're talking, starting to talk about spiritual care, we're really working on getting the family to agree as surrogates. That you may need to really shorten that and free up that ventilator who, for someone who's coming in and hasn't had a chance and has a much better prognosis at that point than this other patient does four or five days later. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a double barreled question now. I've forgotten the second part of the question. No, that was. Okay. I think, I think that got to it. Yeah. Um, uh, here's about sort of a, a question about sort of disadvantaged populations. Can you please comment on the management of incarcerated populations during the pandemic? Yes. Uh, first of all, I, I'm somewhat dismayed that the number of Thing, num the number in the Q&A bubble is going up rather than down. Yeah, so uh, some of the biggest outbreaks of COVID have been in state and federal prisons. And where that is really a problem is those people are then transferred to community hospitals and they're often overwhelmed. So uh, some colleagues of mine in San Francisco, Bree Williams and Leah Rory, have a paper under review that talks about the dilemmas that community hospitals are facing taking care of large numbers of incarcerated people, particularly when the prison guard and the warden are not allowing the doctors and nurses to talk to the next of kin or to provide medical information to the patient. Uh, so I think that it is a terrible problem now. That's the very tail end. What about prevention, early treatment? I personally think, but I just thought we just, I was just thinking about this last night, so tell me if I'm wrong, that if, you, if it turns out to be the case that monoclonal antibodies are safe and effective for early treatment and prophylaxis, our congregate settings like prisons and nursing homes at the top of the list for receiving priority because of uh, the, the possibility of, of, of unchecked spread. Uh, so I, I think that given how devastating COVID has been in prisons, I think we need to, to really think creatively about that. Um, and let me just say a lot of uh, uh, state and even federal prisons uh, do not receive uh, the top quality medical care that we all would like to think that prisoners should get and actually have a constitutional right to. Great. Um, next question then is, uh, I'm curious why the one year life expectancy horizon was chosen rather than say a five or 40 year one. And yeah. on a related note, what are your thoughts on age being a tiebreaker, but not a primary consideration? Yeah, yeah, no, good question. So uh, I think the, the, the problem is that it's well, several fold. First, I think it's a lot harder to predict five year prognosis and 40 year prognosis. We're not great at predicting one-year progress. I think that we have a better, better handle on that, uh, better statistics. Uh, I actually think there is merit to the argument of having a chance to live through all stages of a, of a life cycle. Uh, and it's actually interesting uh, in Italy and to some extent in the UK, a lot of elderly people said, you know, I know there's a shortage. Give it to someone younger, like the age of my grandchildren. 
rather than someone like me. Uh, so I think there's a natural sense that if you're kind of had a chance to live through all your life stages, priority to someone who hasn't had that chance makes makes ethical sense. Whether that can be a national policy or a, an official policy, I think that's questionable. The American Geriatric Society strongly objected to using age as the criteria and saying it just was just blatant age discrimination. Um, let me see, there's a question in the chat then that you mentioned that one important portion of triage is that the individual physician should not be burdened by this, but be able to focus on the patient at hand. How do you do this while at the same time encouraging physicians to practice with responsible and thoughtful use of resources? And then how do you suggest measuring unintended impacts of policies put in place? Okay, so yeah, I, I think, and again, those who in the ICU can say more. I think it's incredibly stressful for ICU physicians and nurses because when they're overwhelmed, it's really overwhelming. I think their natural reaction as caregivers is to try and do the best for the patient in front of them. Front of them. So I think separating the role of resource allocation from the bedside treating physician and nurse, I think makes sense. Uh, I also think it's in particularly important here because with so much, uh, so much of sort of family support is now missing for hospitalized patients. I think to the extent, and there's some anecdotal evidence that families really appreciate the sense that their doctors and nurses are doing is their very best. Uh, so I think to, to put them in a dual role is a conflict of, 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 of roles. Uh, so I would, I would, uh, I would favor. Uh, uh, so how do you assess untoward consequences? So I gave, I've been giving plugs for the quantitative researchers. So I'm gonna do some plugs for mixed methods and qualitative researchers. I think you have to do in-depth interviewing with people uh, in a systematic way and say, ask them, how is this policy working out? What is it like to try and operate, you know, work under, under this policy? Uh, I must say, by the way, parenthetically, uh, and Mark, again, this is like a teaser for tomorrow. Some members of the press have done a really great job sort of trying to understand and put out in public the, what it's like to be a healthcare worker on the front lines and feel overwhelmed. And I'll be talking some about this uh, tomorrow. But I think qualitative research is so important because it gives that rich, in-depth perspective that it's really hard to get with uh, uh, just quantitative uh, tools. Um, there's another question that just came in. If the flu and COVID overwhelm the healthcare system in the coming months, will the cause of disease, so flu versus COVID, be a factor in determining who receives the scarce resources? Hmm. It would if we think the prognosis is, mark is materially different. Uh, I think one thing we are finding with COVID is that the time course on a ventilator is longer than it is for other causes of uh, acute respiratory dis distress syndrome. Uh, so I think, yeah, I, that by the way, that's, that question really points up the importance of putting some time in now to develop policies that are improved over what's been proposed so far because we need them in place because things are almost certainly going to get worse uh, this, this fall. Even if we have a vaccine approved or at least released an emergency use authorization. Um, you know, people don't even get the flu shot. So and that works fairly well. Not great, but it's fairly well. 
Yeah, there, there a, a question came in about vaccines um, yeah. a bit earlier, and this is certainly something we're going to address later in the series with at least two two lectures on on, on allocation of, of vaccines. But just sort of you know briefly, how do you, you suggest we determine who gets vaccines earlier and who gets them later? Well, I actually think the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report that just came out a couple of weeks ago uh, does a pretty good job. I really recognize this different phases. Uh, I think it's really important that there be a uniform policy that is advocated at all levels. I mean, the CDC, the ACIP, HHS, they need to be on the same page and the state health directors need to be on the same page. If to the extent that you have some people saying vaccines uh, don't work, they're a trick of the elites or the devil, whoever, and people should avoid them. They cause all these horrible illnesses. Uh, I think there's so much distrust of vaccines already. Um, but I think it's really going to be an uphill battle. I mean, I think we could end up in a situation where there is a good vaccine, at least one, and people don't take it because they don't trust anything anymore. I think, are there any additional questions? I think we made it through. Leave your message for all of the questions there. Are there any? You know, I, I, I have a question, Mark? Brian. Um, Bernie, can you hear me? I can, yes. Yeah. I would like to know if you are aware of any instances in the United States of people who are on vents being removed from the vents because someone comes along with a better SOFA score or other factors. And if, if you are aware of such a thing, which states has it happened in and how often? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that, Mark. Uh, I don't have any information. Uh, my guess is that it's much more likely when someone is not doing well that the in-hospital team talks to the family and says, look, he's really gone downhill. He's not improved. He's developed this and that. And we're just wondering if it's time to shift to think about comfort and what can we do, to, you know, good palliative care to make his uh, passing as dignified as it could be and what can we do to support you? Um, my sense is that that's the preferred way to do it. That's the traditional way that we've done it and to the extent that that's always better if to do that than to sort of say, well, we're going to just pull the plug. Well, I've, as someone who many, many years ago started and ran an ICU at the University of Chicago, uh, I can say that that kind of perspective and attitude is driven more strongly if there's someone else who is healthier and more, more likely to survive, um, who is waiting to come in, than if th there is no pressure to, um, to, to do such a thing. Has there been anything written about this? I've not, I've not seen anything. And I guess the other thing is I'm not, I think it's more likely to have something someone would say informally than to write it up as a case study. Yeah. Well, um, fellows, are there any other final questions? Uh, did we get Teresa Williamson's question? R Brian? Uh, the one in the chat, yeah. Yes, you got that. Yeah. Um, Bernie, I can't thank you enough. I, I'm excited about your talk tomorrow about how physicians and medical students a deal with COVID-19, um, and that'll be at one o'clock Chicago time. Um, and I want to thank the attendees so much uh, for being here.
And uh, I very much want to thank Brian for uh, taking us through the questions and moderating them. Um, thank you all. It's been, it's been a lovely meeting. Okay, and thanks for the invitation, Mark. It's always a pleasure to interact with you and, and your group. Uh, Take care. Honored to have you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.